Hey everybody, Mr. Brooks back again. Uh, so this is our very last section that we're going to be dealing with in this course. So thank you for uh, riding along with me today. Uh, and this will wrap up uh, differential equations for us. So this will wrap up Math 2214 for those at Virginia Tech. If you're not at Virginia Tech, uh, then I hope this helps out. So this is talking about stability. Again, this is a very brief uh, section. Uh, it's only like uh, six or seven pages with a lot of information uh, built in there, but uh, we've boiled it down to a pretty quick way to talk about it. So 6.4 is talking about stability. Uh, so when we talk about these uh, equilibrium points, we want to talk about how stable they are. So this makes sense in the physical realm. Uh, so again, I alluded to it in 6.2, but if you did not watch that lecture, then uh, hopefully you do go back and watch it. But if not, uh, with 6.4, when we're talking about stability, think about a pendulum. Uh, and let's say that it's uh, that it's not encased in a box. It's, let's say it's attached to a wall. All right. If it's hanging down and resting, then if I disturb it just a little bit, if I somebody comes and touches it, it's going to wiggle a little bit, but there's not going to be much deviation from that equilibrium point, uh, which where it's at rest. However, if I decided, okay, I'm going to swing this thing up to where it's vertically positioned, uh, pointing upward. It's resting on that hinge. So if somebody came and tapped it then with just a little bit of disturbance, uh, perturbation is what we're going to be calling it, but it's, it's a disturbance or a movement. Uh, then all of a sudden that thing's going to take off and swing around. It's just like if, uh, watching kids at a playground or that you've done this as well uh and watching my nephew uh, hopefully he doesn't do this but he might anyways uh but if you're swinging if you sit on a swing and somebody pushes you you're just going to go back and forth a little bit and finally come back to rest with not much motion and again you'd have to push pretty hard to get a big swing to come out however if we were doing one of those and you start building up this momentum and get rested up to where and hopefully you're locked in uh, and your head is pointed towards the ground now, and you're up above the uh, the bar where the swing is attached to, you move just a little bit, what's going to happen? You're going to have this huge disturbance. You're going to swing right through and maybe then back up around, but then eventually you're going to go further away from where your equilibrium point was at the beginning. So this is what we talk about stability. So where you're sitting down at the bottom, where we haven't moved the swing and you come and sit on it, that's a very stable equilibrium point. However, if you moved it up and somehow were able to sit in it uh, where it's vertically pointed, then that's an unstable position because any type of uh, disturbance to you is going to cause you to become very displaced rather quickly. So that's that's the idea of stability here. Is So uh, if that's a good visualization, then use it. Uh, we're going to get into more uh, in-depth definitions of it, but nothing too bad. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about it. So a solution of a differential equation reveals the behavior of the model si uh, system. Thus, it is crucial to understand the properties of the solution. So what does it actually mean? Uh, so that's where, again, stability comes into play. So stable and unstable equilibrium points. So I'm going to mention these a couple of times, and we're going to go very generic, and then we're going to get into more specifics of what they mean. So first of all, uh, so stable and unstable equilibrium points, consider the first order system. And here we are dealing with a system of linear equations. So I'm going to try to bold these letters as best as possible. All right. That is, that has a particular equilibrium solution. And we're going to call that again, e, uh, Y sub E. So in general, we call a equilibrium solution or equilibrium point. We'll call that point. So that was a typo. Uh, unstable if small perturbations. Now I said that fast because I had to look it up to make sure I was saying it correctly. So small disturbances and small perturbations from an equilibrium From equilibrium state lead to big 
deviations. Again, think about um, the kid on the swing that's pointed up towards the sky. He's going to be, if you just barely push or if he barely breathes, all of a sudden he's going to become swinging with big deviations away from that solution point. All right. It's stable if after perturbation, meaning it's disturbed. The deviation of the system from equilibrium is small and stays under control. All right, and it's asymptotically stable if after perturbation it not only stays in control, it also will eventually come back to the original position. All right, so what does that mean mathematically speaking? All right, so uh, stability of equilibrium points, okay? <clears throat> so, the equilibrium point is A, stable, if all solutions stay within a finite, sorry, distance from the equilibrium point. Now I'm going to say equilibrium point is EP. All right. Mathematically speaking, so this is where the, the fun stuff comes into play. So, and I'm going to add one note here before I go into there. And this is not asymptotically stable. So there is going to be a slight difference here. So asymptotically stable means stable. So if you were thinking of an umbrella, uh, overarching umbrella, the word stable contains this, but uh, asymptotically stable is not the th same thing as just a normal stability. Okay, so there, there's an extra requirement for it, and we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. So, but what does it mean to be stable? Given any epsilon greater than zero, there exists some delta greater than zero such that Every solution satisfying the norm of y sub zero minus y sub e. So we're looking at the initial point versus the distance between the initial point and the equilibrium point is less than delta also satisfies the norm of the solution or the the equation minus 
the equilibrium point is less than epsilon. For all t greater than or equal to zero. So graphically what this means is we have some point here, y sub e, all right, and some particular point here, this is our initial point. y sub 0. All right. These guys are within a certain distance of each other. And so I'm going to do this in red. So a circle is enclosed these guys around. All right. And that circle has a, dist a, di a radius of delta. All right. Then if we satisfy this part, if we can find out that this distance is less than delta, then there's this other circle here. That has the diameter of epsilon to which encloses, let's see, we'll use black, encloses the trajectory. So this is just one idea. So if the trajectory was some uh, ellipse or something like that, then this is what it could look like. Uh, it could also have a spiraling effect where it eventually leads into uh, this equilibrium point. So this one is actually representing what stability looks like, that eventually we're going to end back up uh, near the equilibrium point. Okay. So this is the idea, is that we are trapping this in into some concentric circles. All right. The idea is that we don't want to escape this outer circle that has the diameter or the radius of epsilon. All right. So B, asymptotically stable. Forgot the P in there. So let's fix that. So asymptotically stable is is stable if all solutions move toward the equilibrium point. What this means mathematically is it's not only stable but also the limit as t approaches infinity of y of t is going towards this equilibrium point. So if we were to graph this idea here, again, I'm going to go a little bit quicker with my drawing. trying to draw a circle and that's going to turn out horrible. So the outer circle is representing the epsilon diameter or radius and then the interior is representing the delta radius. What this means is if we follow these trajectories then that means all of our solutions are eventually no matter where they are inside of here are leading to this uh, equilibrium point. So that's what that means. So the idea of stability is eventually that, yeah, we expand outside of this delta circle, but we stay with inside epsilon. So we don't go outside of that. For asymptotic 
we actually come inside uh, and eventually uh, approach as T approaches infinity. So as we increase time, eventually these guys are going to approach this equilibrium point. So that would be more of a swing, if you will, for that part. Whereas uh, staying under control, like if I had a tire and I pushed it a little bit, it's going to roll away from the original equilibrium point, but it's going to be close to it. All right. And part C, it's unstable. If one or all move away. Now again, this is talking about for all values of epsilon and uh, delta. So if we set those big enough, then we can say, okay, then it's within inside these rounds. But like if we were say our equilibrium point is a foot above the uh, axis point. So if we had something, here is our pendulum vertically hanging. So this is, we'll say this is a distance of one foot and I make my eps or my delta two feet, then that's going to incorporate when it starts, when it eventually comes to rest down here. But this is saying for all values of epsilon and delta. So if I move away from here, this is going to move away from this equilibrium point here. Meaning eventually it's going, it's, since it's moving away, then it's no longer going to come at a rest there. So that's what that means. All right, so let's look at a few examples that's going to illustrate this. And uh, these are going to take up some room. So again, tread carefully when you come up to solve these guys. Uh, so here we're going to look at y prime is equal to a y, uh, where a is equal to negative 2, 1, 1, negative 2. All right. And I want to show that e to the y, that this is the only equilibrium point. So that's what we're going to do in all three examples, is to show that this zero vector is the only equilibrium point uh, for our particular uh, system and investigate its stability. So the first one I am going to run through the calculations, but the other ones I'm going to kind of skip a little bit to get there. But again, we're going to talk about it as we go. So for this one, again, I want to show that this is the only equilibrium solution. So I want to justify that y1 and y2 can only be 0, 0. So this is what I want to occur. So just going through some simple, and here we don't need the augmented matrix, but I'm going to show it just because uh, if these values are different, then I need to set my augmented matrix up because if I do any row operations, I need to keep track of what I do on this right-hand side of the equation. All right, so row one plus two row two is gonna give me uh, zero, negative three, one, negative two, zero, zero. And then I'm gonna do negative one third row one, zero, one, one, negative two. And then I'm going to do row two plus two row one, and that will give me zero, one, one, zero, which means in the end, and I left off my augmented matrix, that zero, one, one, zero, I even said it, but I wrote it differently, that this forces y1 and y2 to be the only values zero, zero. So y1 has to equal zero and y2 has to equal zero. So this shows that this is the only equilibrium point. Next step. 
I need to find out what the general solution is because I do need to talk about that. So looking at stability, notice in our definition we're talking about y sub t. This is the solution. Okay, so I need to find the determinant of a minus lambda i and set it equal to zero. So we're going to get negative 2 minus lambda squared minus 1 is equal to 0. And then eventually you'll find out that lambda is equal to negative 1 and lambda is equal to negative 3. All right. Since that's the case, let's look at when lambda is equal to negative 1. So we're going to get negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1 times our x1 and x2. Setting those equal to 0. And notice here that the second row is just a negative constant multiple of that. So this is essentially solving negative 1, 1, 0, 0, x1, x2. So negative x1 plus x2 is equal to 0. So x2 is equal to x1. So our vector here is 1, 1. Looking at lambda is equal to 3, we get 1, 1, 1, 1. And clearly we can see that this is going to give us a really clean solution. Uh, so x1 plus x2 is equal to 0. So x2 is equal to negative x1. Meaning our second eigenvector is 1, negative 1. All right. So that means y of t is equal to c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the negative 3t, c1 e to the negative t minus c2 e to the negative 3t. So this is our general solution. So now let's talk about stability. So we need to find the norm of these. So I need to find, I need to find, and we're going to look at the relationships. Y sub 0 minus Y sub E and the norm of Y sub T minus Y sub E. The nice thing is some really clean stuff happens with these. So I'm going to do this in blue, just to give us a different value to look at. Well, y sub 0 minus our equilibrium point is the same thing as if I said the norm of just y sub 0, because this is the 0 vector. All right. So we're going to take and evaluate this at t is equal to 0. So let's go ahead and write that up here. y sub 0 is equal to uh, c1 plus c2 and then C1 minus C2. So that's what we're going to use. So again, when we're finding the norm, this is the square root of adding the squares of each of the terms together. Okay, so we're going to have C1 plus C2, the quantity squared, plus C1 minus C2, the quantity squared. When adding these guys together, uh, we're going to get a negative of the middle terms cancel out. So what we're going to get is we're going to get 2 times c1 squared plus c2 squared. All right, so that's going to come in handy here in just a second. And now we're going to look at the norm of y sub t minus y sub e. Again, this is the same thing as finding the norm of y sub t. All right, so this one looks a little bit more complicated, but it's nothing horrible c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the negative 3 t the quantity squared plus c1 e to the negative t minus c2 e to the negative 3 t the quantity squared again some nice algebra happens for us and we get 2 times c1 squared e to the negative 2 t plus c2 squared e to the negative 6t. 
All right. This is where some fun math is going to come to play. This is equal to the square root of 2e to the negative 2t. Again, I'm pulling out this for a reason. c1 squared plus c2 squared e to the negative 4t. All right. Now, if this is equal to 1, notice for any value of t, this is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is less than or equal to the square root of 2 e to the negative 2t times c1 squared plus c2 squared. Again, this term here is always less than or equal to 1. So therefore, this is a true statement that uh, the square root of 2e to the negative 2t times c1 squared plus c2 squared is greater than or equal to the previous term. Well, the nice thing is, is this is equal to the square root of 2 times c1 squared plus c2 squared, all times e to the negative t. And the reason I'm bringing that into play is we just found out that the norm of y sub 0 is equal to the square root of 2 times c1 squared plus c2 squared. Which means that this is equal to the norm of y sub 0 times e to the negative t. All right. So let's talk about stability then. So now we actually have all of our pieces. Because again, go back to your definition of stability. All right. I'm going to see if oh, that was not what I wanted to do. Yeah. So we're going to see if this is going to work. Copy. All right. Again, so this way we have our definition here. All right, not sure why I did that. Is everything else okay? Okay, everything else is good. All right, so notice here that given any epsilon greater than zero, there exists some delta greater than zero such that every solution satisfying our norm here of y sub zero is less than epsilon, okay? So given any epsilon, that's the three, epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that every solution satisfying y sub zero minus y sub e, so now we can say that this is less than delta, then, so I'm going to underline where these are playing from, the norm of y sub t is less than epsilon for all t greater than or equal to zero. And I'm going to underline that in black where it's coming from. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, Notice what inequality that we have set up for ourselves. We have just stated that y sub t, again, this is the big circle, if you will, is less than or equal to y sub 0 times e to the negative t, which is less than or equal to y sub 0, the norms of y sub 0. All right. The reason I stated this is because e to the negative t, the largest it's ever going to be, is 1. So, and this is for t is greater than or equal to 0 in that case. So I want to make sure that that's stated. All right. Notice we need y sub 
the norm of y sub 0 to be less than delta, then y sub t has to be less than epsilon. Well, by this inequality, we can guarantee that y sub, the norm of y sub t is less than epsilon by taking delta to be less than or equal to epsilon the whole entire time. Thus, our equilibrium point is stable. All right. So that means for any epsilon, all we have to do is say, well, then delta has to be just less than or equal to it. And that's it. And this is for all. So this is generalizing it for everything. Now the question is, is this asymptotically stable? The quick answer is yes, and there's a reason. We take the limit as t approaches infinity of y sub t. Now remember, y sub t was equal to e to the negative t. Just reminding ourselves. Sorry. C1 e to the negative t plus C2 e to the negative 3t. C1 e to the negative t minus C2 e to the negative 3t. Well, look what happens here. As t approaches infinity, both of these terms are going to go to zero, no matter what value of c1 and c2, which is equal to our equilibrium point. So therefore, this is asymptotically stable. All right. Next example. All right. Again, I want to show y sub e is equal to zero is the only EP equilibrium point. And I want to investigate it. So real quickly, All right, we'll find out as we solve this <clears throat> that y1 is equal to 0 and y2 is equal to 0. So if you go about solving this, you will find out that y1 and y2 both have to equal 0. All right, and I've done a little bit of work ahead. Uh, if you go about solving for this, you will find that the general solution so I'm going to leave this for you to work. Y of t is equal to C1 e to the t times 1 negative 1 plus C2 e to the negative 3 t. 1, 1. All right. Notice we have an issue here. If C1 is not equal to 0, then any solution can become unboundedly large as t approaches infinity. So as t grows, this term here is going to blow up to infinity. So if C1 is not equal to 0, again, we're parameterizing this so as t approaches infinity, this is going to blow up. Now we won't use infinitely, we'll use unboundedly. All right. So that means more than likely we can anticipate that y sub v e again, 
and assuming that it's unstable because again this is going to go far away from the equilibrium point all right to prove this we got to go a little bit further we need to show for some epsilon greater than zero, there is no delta that works. All right, so if C1 is not equal to zero, and we're gonna make life a little bit easier for ourselves, and C2 is equal to zero, that means we're dealing with Y of T is just equal to C1 e to the t and the reason we're doing this is one we could go through the calculations with c1 and c2 but if we throw out c2 and just look what happens because we know issues are going to happen with c1 not being equal to zero so we want to see what happens in just this particular equation because what we're saying is any solution uh, and back to our definition of unstable if one or more solutions move a, uh, far away from the or outside of these two concentric circles then we consider it to be unstable so that's the, what we're trying to prove is this on a cleaner scale here to prove instability or unstableness so again since we are dealing with the zero vector as our uh, equilibrium point i'm finding y uh, the norm of y sub zero and again y sub zero in this case is equal to just c1. And negative c1. All right. So that means we are going to get c1 squared plus c1 squared. So this is equal to two, the square root of two times the absolute value of c1. Likewise, this is equal to the square root of 2 times c1 squared, sorry, c1, absolute value of it, times e to the t. Well, just like before, when we we're trying to set up this inequality, we want y of t to be less than epsilon for, uh, and find a delta. So y of t is equal to the square root of 2 times absolute value c1 e to the t which is equal to y sub 0 times e to the t so notice here as t approaches infinity so does the norm of y sub t so this means we're getting further and further away as t increases all right so that means we cannot set a particular delta uh, that's less than zero for this to work because if we do then we're still going to be blowing up as t approaches infinity so this is this is where some issues come into play so this is what we call an unstable uh, equilibrium point All right, so moving on to our last example, and then this will lead, so notice what's happened. So we've had two negative real solutions. We've had a negative and a positive solution, and now we're gonna look at another one. I flipped the wrong way. All right, so consider, again, y prime is equal to a y, where a is equal to zero, one, negative one, zero. All right, and again, I'm saying my equilibrium point here is the zero vector. All right, we're going to determine if it's asymptotically stable, stable, or unstable. All right, so first of all, if we go through the, through the motions, we are going to find out that this is the only solution for this to occur. And if you go about solving this, the eigenpairs of A are 
lambda 1 is equal to i, and it has the eigenvector of u is equal to 1i. And since it's we're dealing with complex values, we're going to see that its conjugate is going to pop up. So negative i and its vector of u2 is equal to the conjugate of u1, which is equal to 1 negative i. And again, we only need one of these in order to find the solution. So y of t can be found to be c1 times cosine of t. Again, in order to find these, all you have to do is you, you're going to use Euler's formula. The nice thing is e to the uh, you'll have just e to the i t, so that means uh, you're going to be multiplied by 1, so just sine and cosine by themselves. So just writing this guy out so we can see where these are coming from. So if we look y sub 0, we're putting 0 into this guy. So cosine is going to be 1, sine is going to be 0. So we're going to get c1 and c2 as our y sub 0. And again, since and I'm going to write this one out, this is just equal to the norm of y sub 0. This is equal to the square root of c1 squared plus c2 squared. The norm of y sub t is equal to the square root of c1 cosine of t plus c2 sine of t squared plus c1, sorry, negative c1 sine of t plus c2 cosine of t. The nice thing is we're going to have a negative terms pop up here that's going to cancel out the middle. And then we're going to have cosine squared plus sine squared. Those are equal to 1. So we're going to get the square root in the end of c1 squared plus c2 squared. Which is equal to the norm of y sub 0. For when t is greater than or equal to 0. So this is the really cool part of the, about this particular one. The distance, again, this is the distance away from... Uh, our equilibrium point of the solution from the origin remains constant. So no matter what epsilon delta we choose, these guys are always equal to each other. So this is the cool part. Uh, so they're always going to be constant in time. And so these are generating circles centered at the origin. So given an epsilon greater than zero, we simply state that our delta just needs to be equal to epsilon. So since we're saying since delta is equal to epsilon, Y sub zero, the norm of y sub 0 is equal to the norm of y sub t, and these guys are always going to be less than epsilon. So this is, the, is an example of a stable solution, but this also shows you even though it's stable, it is not asymptotically stable, because as t approaches infinity, we're going to be bouncing between negative and one and one for cosine and sine. So therefore, 
the biggest is going to be is can be two away depending on what c1 and c2 are so they're multiples uh and then zero uh so or negative one so that that's the nice thing about this or negative two uh so that's the nice thing about this one it is stable yet it's showing that as t goes it's, you're just generating this trajectory of a circle about the origin and that's all that's happening so this leads to some characteristics of stability for a uh, particular autonomous system. So that's what this next part is about. And this is just a quick wrapping of what we're doing. Because notice what happened. We dealt with both negative real solutions. So we dealt with a negative and a positive, And now we dealt with imaginary. So this is coming from theorem 6.3. All right. So let A be a real invertible two by two matrix then the autonomous linear system y1 is equal to a y has a unique equilibrium point y sub e is equal to zero this equilibrium point is one asymptotically stable if all eigenvalues of a have negative real parts In other words, the eigenvalues can be real and negative, or they can be complex conjugate pairs with negative real parts. So this goes both ways for that. Number two, stable but not asymptotically stable If all eigenvalues are purely imaginary, and number three, unstable, if at least one eigenvalue as a positive real part. And that's it. So that's the cool part is if you can you can determine if you've already found the equilibrium solution, if you've already determined those guys, you can actually find out just by the eigenvalues if those guys are going to be stable, asymptotically stable or unstable. So that's the really cool part about this uh, eventual finding. All right, so that ends uh, our last lecture of 6.4. Uh, good luck studying for the finals, guys, and enjoy your summer once you complete this. Uh, and it was great teaching you guys. Have a wonderful day.